When we did linear motion, we spent a lot of time graphing the behavior of an object moving under the influence of a constant acceleration. That graphing tried to help develop some intuition around the, di the difference between a velocity and a position and an acceleration and a velocity, and develop that intuition to the point where we could recognize what was happening when acceleration caused a change in velocity and how that change in velocity would affect the position. We want to go through the same thing now when we talk about angular motion. Let me imagine a scenario for you where I am standing at the front of my class and I'm looking straight ahead at the class for most of the lecture. Let's imagine, however, that about 15 minutes into the class, I turn to face a student on my far left to answer a question. If I say that my angular position was initially pi over 2 because I'm facing straight ahead, but I'm going to change my direction of motion over to pi, which is on my left, then let's say I turn back to face the rest of the class and continue my lecture. I've, turn, I've turned my head back to theta is pi over 2. And let's say at about 45 minutes into the lecture, I turn to this, a student on my right to answer another question, so on my right being theta is 0. How would I graph this information? Well, I would do the same thing that I would do in a, a graph of position versus time, except now I'm going to plot my theta, or angle, versus time. And I would need the graph to go from 0 to pi. And most of the time, I spent my, my direction being at theta is pi over 2. So the graph would look like this. It would initially start out for the first 15 minutes being at pi over 2 and constant. And then 15 minutes into the class, it jumps over to being at pi and then it comes back. Then I continue my class until 45 minutes into the class, and my head juts over to the left, excuse me, to the right, which is theta of zero, and then resumes back to teaching class, and class lets out at 60 minutes later, or 60 minutes. Now, I've made the graph of theta versus t, and we know some things about uh, position, velocity, and acceleration from our linear motion experience, when you look at this graph, there are some changes happening. When there's a change happening, we know that there's a velocity. And so we have to look at parts of the graph where there's a slope and say that there's an angular velocity. So let's take a look at what the angular velocity would look like. Remember that velocity represents the change in position in the linear case. So velocity equals delta x over delta t. By the same token, we expect the angular velocity omega to represent a change in the angle. So it's going to be a delta theta over delta t. Or for those of you comfortable with calculus, this is a d theta over dt. So let's think about the graph that we drew before when we have the professor addressing the students. The graph of theta versus t looks like this. There are a couple locations where the theta is changing. So we're going to use this graph to then make a, a graph of the angular velocity corresponding to the same time of the narrative. Velocity is always going to be the slope of position versus time, or the derivative, if you want to talk about calculus. So for the first period of this class, there is no slope. The slope is 0 for the theta versus time graph. And as a result, omega is going to have a value of 0. However, the slope in this region of the graph is positive. And so omega has to be a positive value. It's constant during that time. Then omega is 0 right here because the slope of this theta versus time graph is 0. And then the slope of this graph is negative. And so omega comes down here as negative for a little while. Then omega, the angular velocity is zero for a while, and then the reverse happens. The slope goes negative, and then it's zero, and the slope goes positive. And then we go back to not moving anymore, and so omega is zero. Notice that sometimes omega is a positive number, and sometimes it's a negative number on this graph. This has the same meaning that we've seen previously. Omega is greater than zero means that theta is increasing. Omega is less than zero means that theta is decreasing. Omega equal to zero means that theta is constant.
So there are some examples of each of those cases on these graphs. The dotted orange line is crossing the graphs at exactly a point where omega is greater than zero. In other words, theta is increasing. The dotted green line is crossing both graphs at a point where omega is less than zero because theta is decreasing. And the dotted blue line is crossing the graphs at a particular point where omega equals zero. So there are many more points that we could have crossed over or, or highlighted, but these three certainly kind of satisfy the three conditions I've shown. Let's refine our graph of angular velocity just a little bit, because there's something slightly unrealistic about this graph. As you know, an object that's moving along has to ramp up to its eventual speed. It can't just uh, be at that speed all of a sudden. And also, it can't just halt to a, uh, grind to a halt instantly. It can't just instantly stop. So a better graph for omega is one in which the, the object may have been out here at uh, omega of zero, it's not moving, but it ramps up to this final speed. Maybe it coasts at that speed for a little while and then it ramps back down to zero. And then, by the same token, it may have to ramp down to some negative angular velocity. It can coast there for a little while and then it has to ramp back up again to be back up to angle, uh, omega of zero. You can't just have the object start instantly or stop instantly. In the same way that a car doesn't get to 60, seconds, 60 miles per hour in zero seconds, it has to ramp up to that speed. Or the wheels of a car, if we're thinking about the rotational aspect of it, have to ramp up to some rotational velocity. They can't just be at that rotational velocity. And the wheels of that car have to ramp down to omega of zero. They can't just instantly stop. So the refined graph that we've just drawn for omega has an angular acceleration called alpha. And this ang angular acceleration is positive when the object is increasing in angular velocity. It's negative when the object is decreasing in angular velocity. And it's zero when the object is at constant angular velocity. So if we were to try to draw, draw the graph of alpha, it might look, like, might look something like this. And you can mentally take a line and draw it across uh, these graphs and ask when alpha is po has a positive slope upward is, is excuse me when omega has a positive slope upward does in fact alpha look like it's positive when omega is constant be it at zero or at some constant value is alpha zero and when omega has a negative slope does alpha then look like it's negative in that case and so the graph of alpha has some much more complicated structure than just the one for omega did.